as I was uh, telling the others, this is, I think I'm going to be at six of the seven evenings of the seven nights of genius. And I, for one, have learned so much. So it's really a pleasure, I think, for all of us uh, to be here. And we're delighted that you're here um, to be part of this conversation about something that I know for all of us, uh, we believe that this is, is just such an important issue that is really being under-addressed. And that is the implication of the genetics and genomics revolutions. A thousand years from now, uh, when people think back uh, uh, at this time, I don't think we're going to be thinking that this was the time of terrorism or of ISIS. What we're going to think is that this was the time that after four billion years of evolution by one set of rules, our species turned a corner and began evolving by a different set of rules. And it, one way I like to think about this is if we had a time machine and we traveled back a thousand years and we took a child and brought them back to today and placed them in a school, we could place them in the preschool here at the 92nd Street Y, that child would grow up to be a kid just like anybody else. But to, if we took that same spaceship and traveled a thousand years into the future and brought a child back, that child would be Superman. And we, have all, we already have all of the tools that we need to remake the evolutionary path of our species. That doesn't mean that we're ready to do it. That doesn't mean that those tools need to evolve. But it's not like we need to invent a magical Gazornenplatt that will allow us to do these things. We have these tools, and you know what they are. It's in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and full genome sequencing. And we, there's a, a, a big data analysis, a lot of these tools that we are going to be deploying, uh, and the way we're going to do it in stages. And the first stage, and probably the most important stage, is we're going to use these technologies to reduce and, it, it, over time, possibly eliminate some terrible genetic diseases that have plagued our ancestors for millennia. And I think we'll all agree that that's a very good thing. But these same technologies and these same approaches that we will use to do those things uh, will open up the possibility to do other things. And there are these, and there, we will have debates and conversations like this about what we should do and what we shouldn't do. Uh, the science will take all kinds of twists and turns that I'm sure we can't uh, anticipate, fully anticipate uh, at this point. Uh, but over time, I believe this will happen in two stages. Uh, the first will be through embryo selection. We already do embryo selection. Uh, I think you all are familiar with in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis where we are screening embryos prior to implantation in the mother. And a second phase over time will be through precision gene editing. Uh, many of you have heard of CRISPR-Cas9 and CRISPR-TPF1, uh, but these are uh, technologies that already exist that are advancing very rapidly uh, that allow us to, to make changes in the genome. Uh, certainly we're doing it a lot with plants and animals, and over time we will uh, do it with, uh, with humans. And this will raise all kinds of very challenging uh, and important questions, uh, including, and we will be forced to ask ourselves, what is the values frameworks, what are the values frameworks that we will use to make these kinds of, uh, of decisions? And one of the areas where we will be able, uh, I believe at least, uh, to start making decisions is the most challenging and the most complex of human traits uh, which is intelligence. And that's what we're going to, to talk a, lo a lot about more. The, world, the word genius is, is difficult to define and confusing, um, but high intelligence, there are, other, there are outlying intelligence, there are other ways that we can describe what we are, uh, what we are, uh, are getting at. Uh, and we have a fantastic panel uh, to, to help, uh, help us explore this series of really important uh, questions. But one thing that I really, uh, it's one of my big messages, is that this is not just a conversation for experts. What we're talking about is the future of our species. And this is, it's a dialogue that every person needs to be, to be part of. And so we're all, I think all of us are thrilled that, that you're here, uh, but this is just the beginning of, of a conversation. And we want you to take what you're learning here and bring it home, bring it to your friends, uh, bring it to, to the people in your life, because this is a conversation that we all need to be, uh, to be part of. So it's a, a tremendous pleasure and honor for me to have such a, a dream team of, uh, of panelists on this panel. Um, and I will, so uh, to, the, to my far left, your right, uh, is Steven Pinker, uh, who's a, a experimental psychologist, professor of psychology at Harvard, one of the world's leading authorities on language and the mind. His 2002 book, The, Bl uh, the Blank Slate, 
explored the idea of human nature and its uh, moral, emotional, and political implications, and that will be released uh, later this year with a new afterword. And uh, next to him is uh, my friend, sociologist Dalton Conley, who's university professor at Princeton. Uh, and uh, Dalton uh, started out as a sociology professor, but then he recognized the importance of this issue set and went back and got another PhD. So we were talking in the green room. You should call him Dr. Dr. Uh, Conley. Um, uh, but uh, in addition to his books on race and class, and some of which have been major bestsellers, uh, he also wrote uh, Parentology on the Science of Raising Children. His forthcoming book, The Genome Factor, What the Social Genomics Revolution Tells Us About Our History, Ourselves, and Our Future, uh, is going to be coming out uh, next year. And to my immediate left, the uh, theoretical physicist uh, Steve Shu is a professor of theoretical phys uh, physics and vice president of research at Michigan State University. Uh, was co-founder and CEO of SafeWeb, an information security startup, uh, and is a scientific advisor, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, to BGI Shenzhen, which is formerly uh, Beijing Genomic Institutes, but then it moved, um, but which is an important player in the field that, fields that we're going to be uh, discussing. And just to give you a little background, uh, conversations are like flowing rivers, so we'll, it will go where it, where it goes, but the, our goal is to explore a series of, uh, of uh, questions. One, uh, can we define intelligence in a meaningful way? Uh, two, if we wanted to genetically enhance uh, intelligence, um, how might we do it? Uh, if it's possible to, um, to do it, should we? And what are the kinds of factors that will drive and will potentially drive this process forward? And what are the things that we need to be doing now to prepare ourselves? So that's the goal, but the uh, conversations are organic beings, and so we will, we will see where it goes, including uh, with, your, with incorporating your questions. So Dalton, let me, let me start with you. Um, is high intelligence, or even intelligence itself, a social construct? I mean, are we, are we trying to measure something? Is it, is it measurable, and how so? Probably Stephen, the psychologist, can answer that better. I, I yeah. would say that from the socioeconomic perspective, regardless of whether or not we believe there's multiple intelligences or we believe in G, the general factor, uh, we know that it predicts economic success in mm -hmm. today's society uh, better than many other factors or variables. So whether or not we believe uh, IQ tests are culturally biased or what have you, uh, they are an important predictor of uh, economic success, that so I think we should be paying attention to them, and uh, and and the biological uh, uh, precursors to them as well. So because there are some people who say that IQ tests don't test intelligence; they test cultural biases. You're saying that you think that they do. I'm saying that mm -hmm. <laughs> I, not, that's not what I said, but I did. <laughs> I, I, I I'm I'm punting on the issue of cultural bias. There's yeah. lots of debates about that. Yeah. Uh, there, how plastic your score on an IQ mm -hmm. test is, how much measurement error there is. Uh, I'm just saying that if I, if you, especially if you give me repeated measures for the same kid, it's going to be very predictive of their, of their economic security mm -hmm. as an adult. That's what I'm. That that's all I'm going <laughs> to say. Yeah, yeah. Say, uh, Steve, what do you there. think? Yeah, uh, the the issue of whether IQ tests are culturally biased has been examined for decades. And you know, some are more than others, but they aren't all, and they aren't. They, are, they don't simply measure fluency or familiarity with a given culture. That is, they um, have the same predictive value as Dalton mentioned across a variety of uh, ethnic and cultural groups and social classes. So the degree to which they predict, um, say, income and health and other measures is the same across a variety of ethnic groups. So it's not that they, uh, if they were biased, you'd expect they would be crummy at predicting anything right. for the non-dominant groups, and that turns out not to be true. They also correlate with a variety of uh, physiological <coughs> measures that one would think are associated with intelligence, such as brain size, thickness of gray matter, white matter connectivity, uh, and more and more they we're seeing that they probably are going to correlate with a complex score that sums small effects over many, many genes. Yeah. So, they, so that, by the way, it doesn't mean that intelligence is not a social construct, right. but it means it's not just a social construct. And why, why do you think, this is a tough question, we talked a little bit about this in, in the green room, and it's, it's, it's challenging for anyone to talk about, but why do you think that this is it's so sensitive? I mean, why is it that when we talk about this, I mean, we're all uncomfortable talking about differences of IQ across the, the, the population. And as 
scientists, what are the, the implications of that? I mean, why, why is it so challenging for us to talk about, about intelligence as a hard thing in the numbers versus a, a, uh, a social construct? Well, I think people fear illegitimately, in my opinion, that it would license discrimination, mm. that if there are certain social classes or groups that score lower, then you would be entitled to uh, keep them out of elite universities or of uh, professional jobs. Now, that's a complete non sequitur because uh, what you really care about if you're hiring or admitting someone is, is the uh, uh, talent and potential of that individual. Uh, part of it might be genetic, part of it may, might be not, but if all you care about is how they're going to do in school, how they're going to do in the job, you don't care about what part is genetic or what isn't. Mm -hmm. You just care about what's going to predict how well they do at what you're admitting them to. And right. so as long as, I, I think as long as you treat people as individuals as opposed to members of some category, then uh, differences in intelligence don't license discrimination, but there is that, that fear. Yeah. There's also the fear that there's a kind of unfairness, a cosmic unfairness that that if you are dealt a hand that is uh, uh, below average, no matter how hard you try, you won't be rewarded for sheer effort. Right. Uh, and that seems cosmically unfair. So people who believe in cosmic justice right. are disconcerted by, uh, by IQ differences. Yeah, this is a 92nd Street Y, so everyone probably believes in cosmic <laughs> justice in, in one level or another. Co I, cosmic, it, yeah. cosmic justice warrior. Yeah, so Steve, how about you? I mean, you're a, you're a physicist. Well, yeah. You're a, a numbers guy. How yeah. do you see this issue? I, I would have to say that uh, as an educator and someone who trains students in an area as esoteric and difficult mm -hmm. as theoretical physics, the, the IQ test or cognitive ability scores are actually a useful input for us to figure out which students are going to be able to actually do the work and get to the research frontier and perform yeah. well. There's one particular study that I would like to mention in this context, which is um, it, sometimes it's called SMPY, Study of Mathematically Precocious Youth. It has a twin, which is SVPY, Study of Verbally Precocious Youth. And this is a very long-running longitudinal study of kids that were identified as gifted already by the age of 13. Mm. So they had to test at least in the top 1% of the mm -hmm. population. And nowadays, this, uh, this whole testing scheme is pretty widespread in the country. So if your kid is identified as being bright in mm. uh, a typical elementary school, often they're asked to take the SAT early. And because they're taking it early, the ceiling is, is extremely high. The top score corresponds to ability like of the order of 1 in 100,000 mm -hmm. people. Okay. So uh, you can ask, okay, if I identify some kids at age 13 already as gifted, but within that population, there are gradations. So there's some kid who's sort of 99th percentile, but then there's another kid who's 99.9th percentile, and there's another kid who's 99.99th percentile. And you can ask the question, because some of these people in the early studies now are in their 50s, you can ask, well, what happened to these kids? And was the test predictive? Even mm -hmm. in this really teeny tiny tail of the super talented population, was the test predictive of what these people accomplished in their lives? And it was. Mm -hmm. So the probability of having a patent issued, mm -hmm. the probability of having written a novel, the probability of having a PhD, the probability of being a research scientist at a mm -hmm. major university, all of these are monotonically increasing, even in this far tail. Mm -hmm. These are all people whose parents brought them to these summer camps to be tested and to be with other bright kids. So you, you, the environmental influences are mm -hmm. fairly level. Almost every one of these kids comes from a good family with good financial resources, but it was the difference between 99.99 and 99th percentile that affected their lives. Yeah. And so it's, if you look at that data, it's very hard to say that these tests are not useful. Yeah, I agree. And Steve, you, in 2009, you famously wrote, the nature-nurture debate is over, all human behavioral traits are heritable. How do you, how do you think about the line between nature and nurture? Well, I was actually quoting from a paper there by mm -hmm. Eric Tur Turkheimer. Um, so there are, uh, he, he titled the paper, only partly tongue-in-cheek, The Three Laws of Behavioral Genetics, mm -hmm. uh, which are that uh, um, all behavioral traits are heritable, um, partially here. Heritable. That means that differences among people within a particular uh, social group are correlated with differences in their genes. And that was established by decades of, of uh, research, mainly with twins and, and adoptees. And a simple way to think about what that means or how that was determined is we all know the famous experiments of identical twins separated at birth who mm. they share all their genes, they're brought up in different environments. Um, so that's a, one way of putting the first law is they are correlated, not perfectly, but highly in mm. anything you want to measure, in intelligence, in personality, in number of cigarettes smoked, in likelihood of getting divorced, mm. likelihood of getting in trouble with the law, hours of TV watched, you name it, there will be mm. a non-zero genetic influence. Right. Second law is that the effects of genes are stronger than the effects of families, 
which is that um, one, way, one a simple way of thinking of that is now imagine adopted siblings. They don't share their genes. Um, they do share their environments, their, their, their parents, their other siblings, books, TVs, and so on. How correlated are they as the result of that common environment uh, by the time they grow up? And the answer is not, not very. Um, so that uh, in much less than the correlation, say, between identical twins reared apart. Then the third law is that uh, there's a lot of variance in, again, in almost anything you measure that is neither genetic nor attributable to the family. And the simple way of thinking about that is uh, take identical twins who are reared together, not the exotic uh, uh, separated at birth cases. How correlated are they? And the answer is you know, uh, a lot but way, way less than 100%. Mm. Now, if you think about that, they share their genes, they share their mm -hmm. mo mom, they share their dad, they share their siblings, they share their, you know, the home. Why aren't they perfectly correlated if they share both their, mm. their genomes and their environments, and they're not? Mm. And that means that there's a huge amount of unexplained variance. Mm. Uh, and there's, there's some debate as to where that comes from. No one really knows. But it it's, it's puts a ceiling on yeah. predictability both of genes and environments. Yeah. More recently, um, Steve and I have a, a, some, a number of colleagues and friends in common, including James Lee and Chris Chabry, published a paper called The Fourth Law of Behavioral Genetics. By the way, the law is a bit tongue-in-cheek because mm -hmm. we don't have laws in psychology. <laughs> but they are highly replicable, and unlike the findings that have been su subjected to scrutiny in the so-called replicability crisis, these replicate massively. Huge samples, hundreds of thousands of people, study after study, country after country. These are really solid findings. So the fourth one, and this is more recent, mm. is that uh, heritable effects are the product of many, many, many genes, each with a very, very small effect. So there's not going to be an IQ gene that gives you, you know, five IQ points or ten IQ points. IQ points. They're going to be a hundred of them, maybe a thousand of them, maybe ten thousand of them, each of which gives you, you know, an, a tenth of an IQ point, higher or lower. Yeah. So, Dalton, one more question before we talk about how. Um, we're at the 92nd Street Y, and there's a set of people come to talks like this. There's dance performances. There's music. Um, we talked about IQ tests and their predictive, predictive uh, abilities, which is, is for sure. Um, how, do we, how do you think about these just different kinds of intelligences? I go to the New York City Ballet and I think, I could never, I could never do that. That seems pretty, I mean, quote unquote, genius. I mean, how can we incorporate our different types of intelligence and different types of, of outstanding capabilities incorporated into our, our views and our structures of intelligence? Uh, definitely not. I mean, I mean, IQ, as I said at the outset, yeah. is highly predictive of health, economic success, yeah. mortality even. Um, however, it's not the only predictor. We know that even uh, what we call called non-cognitive skills today yeah. uh, is, is a very hot topic. Um, Grit, uh, this Penn psychologist, a Angela Duckworth, talks about basically how long you're going to stick at a hard task, yeah. impulse control, sociability, um, the big five personality traits all predict success. And that's not, that's not even talking about something like right. athletic talent right. or, or, or artistic yeah. ability. So there's a whole bunch of things. IQ is a one factor among right. many. It's an important factor and probably increasingly important factor given the changing nature of the economy. Yeah. I, I, I want to add... Uh, a, a footnote to what Stephen was saying before, because the very, that, that very psychologist, Eric Turkheimer, one of his important findings is that uh, IQ is not equally heritable. So, so he, he found that among economically disadvantaged families, there was a bigger impact of environment, of random influences, mm. and only among the high SES, what we call socioeconomic status families, did the full flourishing of genetic effects come to the four. I think that's an interesting middle ground because it suggests that <clears throat> if given the right kind of hothouse for the orchids, so to speak, uh, then genetic effects uh, come to the fore. But when you're in a situation where you don't have the books or you're you're not able to come to the 92nd right. Street Y and get educated or you're going to bed hungry or whatever, it's not, it, of course, it lowers the mean uh, because there's an environmental component, but it actually just makes the environment way more important and suppresses the effects yeah. of genes. So I think the story is is a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Um, and also one thing that uh, we get afraid of talking about, uh, heritability, meaning the d 
to total additive genetic influence on a trait because we think it means, oh, well, then there's nothing we can do about it. Well, if yeah. income is heritable, I guess we're just going to be stuck with a very wide income distribution. Right. And uh, the economist at Wisconsin, the late economist Arthur Goldberger, used the metaphor of eyeglasses. Um, you're wearing eyeglasses. I had LASIK eye surgery. Um, so just because we know, we know myopia is very highly heritable, but we have a perfect fix for it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you can't do anything because of something uh, is, is genetic in origin. I think we get tripped up in thinking if we show that there's a high heritability of IQ or of, of economic status, well, we might as well just give up uh, and, right. and forget about equality of opportunity or anything yeah. like that. And I, think, I think that's really important. And that's, I mean, I think this, this was the first piece of this conversation because I think it's really important to get this, all of these issues uh, out on the table, just how complex uh, and the issue, our ideas about what intelligence is um, how there are different types of intelligence, how society, we as a species have benefited from our diversity. Um, but all of that then leads us to the second piece of this conversation is that, as I was saying in my introduction, we are now at the cusp of having some pretty unbelievable opportunities should we choose to use them. And we, we talked about uh, about IVF and PGD and, and it's essentially this big category of embryo selection. And what embryo selection right now, I think most people know this, but uh, if somebody is having in vitro fertilization, uh, there's a process called PGD, where at an early stage of the embryo's uh, development outside of the, of the mother, whether it's um, uh, five days or a few more, um, one or two cells are extracted. Those cells are sequenced. And then from that sequencing, you can learn whatever you can learn from, a, uh, from sequencing a gene, uh, you can, a genome, you can learn from those cells. And right now, uh, we use it um, to screen, when it's used, to screen out single gene mutation diseases that people don't want. But if you're sequencing, these, uh, the, if you're sequencing this genome, you can learn everything that is learnable uh, from a cell, and that's, uh, that's a lot. So Steve, this leads um, to you. Um, can you explain a little bit about, and we talked about this over lunch, the consortium uh, with BGI Shenzhen and others uh, that you are, uh, are working with, and, and uh, we've talked about uh, BGI's cognitive genomics uh, initiative, but talk about your, the initiative that you're working on and uh, its goals and time frames, maybe incorporating what we talked about about height. Well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, my background is actually physics, so yes. one might think, what is this physicist guy here doing here talking yeah. about genomics? Um, about five or six years ago, uh, I was following the technological development of sequencing, and uh, the cost to sequence a human genome has been dropping at an exponential rate, so it's, right. you know, it's millions of times cheaper than uh, when the first uh, human genome was sequenced, actually almost a, billion, well, a million times cheaper. So when I saw that cost curve, I realized something interesting is going to happen. And the interesting question is, as we accumulate vast amounts of genomic data, as it becomes inexpensive to sequence genomes, uh, what can we predict from the genome of an individual about their phenotype? Phenotype could be their intelligence, it could be their height, it could be their disease status or disease risk. And um, BGI is one of the largest genomics labs in the world. It's uh, based in Shenzhen, which is across the border from Hong mm -hmm. Kong. And uh, in a strange fit of entrepreneurial zeal, I, I, I was on sabbatical in Taiwan doing physics, and I just emailed them and said, hey, I have various ideas for things that would be interesting to do. And uh, they invited me over, uh, along with James Lee, a former student of Steve's, and another uh, person to give some presentations about research ideas that uh, we could pursue. Um, to I won't, go, I won't drag the audience through the whole history of the last six years of that kind of research, but let me say it this way. Um, the, the main area that I think I've contributed to is developing algorithms for analyzing this mass, uh, massive set of data which will accumulate as we get, say, of order a million human genomes with good phenotype information. And basically, it's, uh, I think last night there was a talk here about AI, the future of AI. And um, uh, the, 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 the methodology behind AI is something called machine learning. Mm. It's using computer algorithms to extract meaning from massive amounts of data. Using modern machine learning tools, um, we have a prediction that for, even for the most complex traits, such as height and IQ, uh, 
our simulations suggest that when you get to of order a million genomes with good phenotype data, now of order could mean two million or three million or half a million, it's something in that range, we think we'll be able to build good genomic predictors, predictors where if you went to a crime scene and uh, you had a little DNA from the, the perpetrator, you run it through your algorithm and you, it tells you this guy, the perpetrator was an Asian American guy, he was six foot one plus or minus two inches, um, and he had an IQ of 160, <laughs> and plus or minus 15 yeah. or something like yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, I think that future, although it sounds like science fiction. It was you. No, I'm just kidding. I have an alibi. I have an alibi, okay. but I have an identical twin. Brother. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that future is coming faster than people realize. Yeah. And um, if I were to say something a little bit technical, I would say that um, what we know about these machine learning algorithms is that when they have sufficient data, they ex there are some physicists in the audience, I know. Mm -hmm. So they exhibit something called a phase transition. So the performance of the algorithm shifts very radically when you, have, when you pass a certain data threshold. Yeah. And so we've made predictions about where that data threshold lies. I, I hope everybody is appreciating the magnitude of what Steve said. It sounds technical, but I'm gonna take a pause here and I can, um, if there's, I don't know if there's a house light so I can just see the audience a little bit more just for this, cause I'm gonna do an audience poll uh, uh, right now. And so, um, and even if I can't, no, there we go, wow, it's amazing. Let there be light. Um, it's the seven days thing, theme. Um, so assuming that you and your partner are going to have a child and either one or both of you is a carrier of a disease, we can, it could be Tay-Sachs, it could be Huntington's, there's all, all sorts of disease. And let's just say uh, that you believed um, that if you had a child with your partner, um, that it's just a, a natural child the old-fashioned way, uh, there would be a 50% chance that your child would be a carrier of that disease. And let's just say for the purposes of this hypothetical uh, that you had three different options. One is you would conceive of your child the old-fashioned way because you want a child and you know that there's always been risk with um, having uh, children. Uh, the other is that you could uh, have your, you or your partner get pregnant and then do testing and you could determine from those, uh, that uh, testing uh, whether the child was a carrier of this disease or not. And then you could make a, whatever your decision was uh, accordingly. Or third, you could do IVF and PGD and uh, have, let's just say that you had uh, 10 or so embryos from 10 eggs that would be extracted uh, from the mother and you could test and let's just say uh, that you could find one of those embryos uh, that wasn't a carrier of, those disease, of that disease and have that implanted in the mother. So A is just traditional childbirth, B is get pregnant and do testing and make a decision, and uh, C is to do IVF and, uh, and PGD and make a decision accordingly. Just by a show of hands, who, is, who would uh, choose A, natural conception? Okay, small number. Who would do B? Uh, getting pregnant and then deciding accordingly. All right, who would do C, IVF and PGD? Okay, so the large majority. That's always the case when I ask, when I ask this question. So here's, here's, uh, here's the next question. Um, you're doing this because you've all decided to, that that's what you wanted to do. And as part of PGD, you're doing a full sequencing of the genome um, of these, let's say it's 10 of these um, early stage embryos. Uh, do you, and let's just say that there's a lot of other information about other traits beyond this one disease that you're testing for. And some of them are, have, deal with disease issues, and some of them deal with things like height, like IQ, uh, maybe um, all sorts of, I mean, as, as Stephen said, there's lots of, uh, everything that we do is heritable uh, and genetic in, in some way. So how many people would only, the question you can choose, I only want to have information about this specific disease state that I'm testing for, and how many people would say, well, if that information is available, I would like to have the information about everybody else. Those are your options. So uh, just the disease state, raise your hand. All of the other information, raise your hand. So what you can see, it, yeah, it's self-selected population. Yeah, it's all right, fair yeah. enough, and they're, 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 they're yeah. all here. <laughs> And so you can see, I mean, the point that I'm, that I'm making is when we put these two pieces together, 
uh, that we have all of these technologies that we're able to do these testing for things like height, like IQ, and I know that the two of you have maybe slightly different views on this, and we'll get to that, um, that we're, we're right on the verge of some pretty big and fundamental decisions. And we're not even talking about gene editing, which is another thing that, that is, is coming down the pike. So Dalton, yeah. Um, my understanding of the of the of the technology at the I mean it's changing so fast yeah. so I it could yes. have even change in the last month and I don't even know about it but um, is that PGE right now we can't amplify enough DNA to do a full genome sequencing we can do a full chromosome scan to make sure there's not trisomy 21 Down syndrome we can make specific mm -hmm. primers if you know you're a carrier for Tay Sachs yeah. or something but we can't but th that's going to be fixed soon enough. Or but it's deep. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, so the current state of the art is, is beyond that now. It's so it's quite routine to take, uh, so you have a blastocyst of, you know, 100 cells, and you have some stuff in the placental region, which isn't really the kid, and you pull maybe a few cells off of that, you amplify the DNA, and you can do the full sequence. You can do it. Yeah. yeah. OK. But I w what I was trying to and, say. And, and in fact, yes. I, I would say probably every day it's being done. Right. Every day. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, bef but before that becomes widespread, I think something else is going to happen first, bef and bef way before mm -hmm. gene editing of, of these highly polygenic traits, where you'd have to edit you know, a thousand different uh, mm -hmm. locations, uh, is the merger of 23andMe, the kind of recreational mm -hmm. genomics, and OkCupid. Mm -hmm. So we have these scores. <laughs> yes. We have these scores that you know we now can, in this latest round uh, that Stephen and I are involved mm -hmm. in, can predict about eight to ten percent of IQ. Um, it, I mean, but that sounds small, but in terms of like the magnitude of difference yeah. of, you know, having a low score or a high score is pretty big. Uh, height is pretty well mapped out now. So you, get, you can get these scores, not just for embryos, yeah. but also for your potential spouse, or, yeah, or but at least yeah, um, we, one night stand, or whatever it's, you want. It's true, <laughs> it's true, and we have that, and that's whatever, that's grad school, that's the mixers that people come to at 92nd Street Y. Um, <laughs> but even then, even then, let's just say that you're, you're whoever you are, it's an amazing genius one, and you find amazing genius two, and you do your tests, and you come together. But then we, you saw the vote here. Then you say, well, geez, let's have a, if we're going to have a kid, let's do it the way people are going to do it in the future. In the, the, the sex well, is too I, risky. We're going to do IVF and PGD. And then we have these 10 options for our kids. Sure, I Which agree one with that totally. Choose? But yeah. I just think that the starting point is going to be greater inequality because the people with these scores are going to swipe right or left or whatever. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's going to be the information right there. And people are going to yeah. sort increasingly on this, not on the actual phenotype, the, you know, how tall they are, not only on the actual mm. phenotype, but actually on their genotype. And that's going to lead to like a uh, even greater widening yeah, than we it, see it, now it, it, before we even get into them it, selecting well, think, the I mean, best people, embryo. I mean, there are lots of people who like know their partner's SAT scores. I mean, the, all these proxies we, we already yeah. have and we're already acting upon them. So it, it, I think mean, it could be true. Both of those things could be true. Steve, you could you're trying yeah, to... Yeah. I, I, we act on them somewhat. There is tremendous assortment of mating by intelligence. Smart people tend to marry smart people. But on the other hand, even before the genomics revolution, we, you could imagine a scenario in which people demand each other's SAT scores uh, yeah. that, when they meet in a bar. Yeah. They <laughs> yeah. marry. Everybody doesn't do that? Yeah, <laughs> they, they marry the person with the highest score, even if there's someone else with a lower score who's better looking and who they like more and who they have more in common. Mm. But no, 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 they, you only marry the person with the highest uh, IQ score. And if you meet someone else before you have children, you drop your spouse for the person with a higher IQ. Yeah. Now, we could do that already. Yeah. Uh, you know, we don't. <laughs> Yeah. So I think it's I, I think it's important not to get carried away with yes. what you can imagine happening if human behavior were determined by a single dimension, which yes. human behavior is not. I, I agree, uh, but I think the the issue for me is that we're going to be I, I believe uh, we're going to be having kids through assisted reproduction in whatever whatever the number is, whether it's ten years or twenty years or fifty years. I think in that X number of years, people who are having kids through the old-fashioned way of conceiving will it, it will seem uh, like risky ideologues. Yeah, it, it'll it'll be like pe like the people who aren't vaccinating their kids yeah. or Christian scientists I, making I, I, ideological. I actually, doubt, I actually doubt that. But anyway, that's my pretty. We'll come yeah, back. That's in, not my in, in, We'll come back in in yeah. in, uh, in 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 fifty years. Um, <laughs> but the um, and you're all you're all invited. And you get free entry at that point. Um, 
So, so phase one is this, it is embryo selection that, that a lot of us will do, some of us will do, some of us are already doing, but it's kind of the, the gateway. I mean, once you have this information that you're talking about, the question is, it's like a little bit actionable if you want to know how tall was the guy who committed this crime. The action that, that people, the, the step that people will take to make this real will be in first phase embryo selection. And then in the second phase, uh, whenever that is, and that could be 10 years, it could be 20 years, it could be 100 years, it could be never, um, but uh, precision gene editing. The gene editing revolution is happening so quickly, unfolding so rapidly, uh, we're using it very, we, not me, but are using it very, very effectively on crops, on animals that are breeding cows that, that don't have horns, they don't have to rip them out in cattle breeding, all, all, all sorts of things. Steve, I'm coming back to you on, on the science. How do you see the intersection of the information that you are getting about height and intelligence uh, and the, the CRISPR precision gene editing revolution. So uh, probably people in the audience have read a little bit about CRISPR, which was a right. breakthrough that just happened in the last few years in uh, a methodology for doing gene editing. There had been cruder methods available, but CRISPR is a kind of uh, quantum leap in capability. And even subsequent to you know when the story became big in the media, there have been even <clears throat> more improvements. And so it's actually in clinical trials right now. So there are people uh, having CRISPR bacteria injected in their eye, I believe, yeah. to uh, edit the genes of the individual cells in their eye to reduce uh, the effect of macular degeneration. So there's some mutation which makes these people susceptible to it. Um, so uh, the claim that's made by people involved in this, um, there's a company called Editus, which just had an IPO related to this. The claim is that it will be soon be demonstrated that this method for gene editing is both safe and effective. Yeah. So safe in that the off-target mutations that are induced are negligible, and effective meaning it really does edit the genes in your eye to prevent macular degeneration. And similar things are being done uh, in reproductive setting, so people are testing it in a reproductive setting. And so actually, surprisingly, I would not have predicted this five years ago. So five years ago, if you had said, what's the first way that uh, human uh, embryo, uh, human reproduction is going to be altered, I would have said it'll, it'll be embryo selection for a long time because right. I didn't think that something like CRISPR would come along. But now I actually think CRISPR is going to probably jump in to the process faster than people think. Now, mm -hmm. the, the main barrier for CRISPR, I believe, is actually we don't know what edits to make. So if it's a, if it's a what we call a Mendelian disease, so it's controlled right. by a single gene, we can go in and edit that single gene back. But the complex traits that we're talking about, where you may have to do 100 edits or you may want to do 100 edits, we don't actually know where to make those edits. So we have to solve the big data problem that I was discussing right. earlier before we decide what the targets of the editing are. And there may be some lag in, in, in time scale in, in terms of figuring out those issues. And what do you think the time frame is I mean, for, for understanding, it's by and large, the, the uh, genetic so we fingerprint, if you will, of height and intelligence. Well, so we have predictions. So we have published papers with predictions based on mm -hmm. these computational results. And so it's when we accumulate a border, and we, it's not a very super precise prediction, but when, say, for example, if we get a million or a few million good genotypes and good phenotypes mm -hmm. for height or for IQ, we will be able to build a good predictor. Yeah. And it seems it's absolutely inevitable that we will get there. Right. Just so because when people talk about personalized medicine, what does personalized medicine mean? It means that, that your, your entire health history is in your file and your fully sequenced genome will be the foundation of, of everybody's medical records forever. So that million number in my mind seems relatively low. So there, there are data sets that will be available within a few years, yeah. actually, I think, that have a million genomes in them and uh, yeah. good phenotyping. So this, I mean, whenever people hear this, and I, we all, I think, talk about this, and I'm sure that everybody in the audience is having two thoughts, like, wow, that's amazing, maybe we can cure cancer, we can, get, we can cure all these terrible, debilitating diseases, and holy mackerel, um, that sounds really scary. I mean, this is the stuff, I mean, I'm a sci-fi writer, but this is the stuff of, of dystopian sci-fi, potentially, which brings us to the last question then we're, uh, for this part, and then we're gonna answer your questions. Um, about values. I mean, ultimately, this, is, this, is, this isn't a conversation about science. This is a conversation where the science brings us into the, to the room, this room, to discuss values. And so, Steve P., 
how should we think about a values framework for making these kinds of, of decisions that are, that are coming more quickly than we anticipate? Yeah. Certainly the values are important, and the starting point is to realize that just because something you can imagine how something is going to be done, uh, it, it, it is not grounds to predict that it will happen that whether a technology actually transforms society depends not just on what's technically capable, but on, a, on the costs relative to the benefits and on a whole set of values, taboos, trade-offs that uh, are often unpredictable, which is why in both directions, technological predictions are, are very dicey. Both it'll never happen and it's around the corner. So just take, right. for example, would anyone have predicted in 1957 that jet travel would be no faster in uh, 60 years <laughs> than it was then? Yeah. Everyone predicted, well, obviously we're gonna have supersonic transport, and right. there's no technical barrier to passenger supersonic right. transport, but the society decided we don't like sonic booms, and uh, uh, gas, uh, uh, jet fuel is too expensive right. and it uses too much of it. And yeah. so there's been total stasis. Yeah. So that can happen. And there are many other examples. We don't have domed cities. We don't have underwater apartments. We don't have uh, a nuclear power too cheap mm -hmm. to meter. All of these predictions did not come true. So you can't just assume because it's possible that it's around the corner. It may not be. Yeah. I think there are a number of reasons to think it's not around the corner. I mean, one of them is that we, uh, uh, all, all of the discussions of the benefits of either choosing or engineering higher intelligence don't take into account the, the risks. And we are both as individual parents and as a society highly risk averse when it comes to new medical technologies. Um, that that uh, if you, uh, we know that if you wanted to engineer a trait with gene editing, it would not be one gene, it would be you know, dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands. We know that genes have multiple effects. Most genes are pleiotropic. Mm. Uh, so there's a gene that might increase your child's IQ by a fifth of a point. But uh, what else might it do? Uh, mm -hmm. Could it increase the chances of epilepsy or brain cancer yeah. or schizophrenia or bipolar? Yeah. The answer is we don't know. Yeah. Because even with the state of the art, which I think is amazingly impressive, these are still correlations. We know that if you have one allele, you've got a uh, completed more years of schooling than you have the alt alternative mm -hmm. allele. We don't know what the intermediate links in the right. chain are, what it actually does in the brain. If you can show that th that gene is actually active in the brain, yeah. you've scored a big scientific win. So that's just how primitive our understanding yeah. of the mechanism is. And if you either pose to parents or to you know, government and hospitals and regulatory committees, there's a chance of a nugatory benefit of a fifth of an IQ point and a risk that we don't know um, I'm, it's not clear that, that, that that's gonna, there's going to be a steamroller of acceptance yeah, there. Yeah. I mean, parents won't even feed their kids genetically modified <laughs> applesauce, yeah. let alone... Which they should. <laughs> let alone... Mo and we have, other, yeah, we have other taboos that are quasi-moral, quasi-yuck yeah. response to things like cloning, mm -hmm. uh, where seven, uh, almost 20 years after Dolly the Sheep, a human has not been cloned, contrary to all predictions, even though I don't think there's even any good ethical case against it, but it is illegal in right. every country. Uh, even mitochondrial replacement, which I think is an ethical no-brainer, right. had yeah. to overcome huge yeah. moral barriers. So the, uh, the vast majority of uh, intellectuals, and I perhaps non-intellectuals, think that <laughs> changing the germline uh, DNA is on a slippery slope to, to Auschwitz. Mm. Okay. Uh, until that changes, we're not gonna see this, this as, a, as a juggernaut. Um, finally, since we know two things about, two, two empirical discoveries about the effects of genes on psychological traits, and across the range of, of academics, psychologists, you know, Steve and, and, and I are very close in acknowledging that there is a substantial effect, uh, that intelligence is real, that uh, it matters, and so on. Um, on the other hand, we also know that um, there is a, a, a ceiling on how much you could predict, forget machine learning, Take your identical twins. Mm. You have one identical twin. You don't have to do any sequencing. You can predict uh, the genetic effects on identical twin number two from identical twin number one. How well can you do? You can do pretty well, but for a lot of traits, the correlation is you know like around you know, 50%. There's a lot of the variance mm. that even having the, what is undoubtedly better than the best machine learning and genome sequencing, we still can't predict the trait down to the last I, IQ point. Um, together with the fact that it's not going to be one gene but thousands, mm. each of which may have pleiotropic effects. And each of, of course, every editing operation, 
mm. is introduces some non-zero probability of a genetic defect. Yeah. Um, I don't see there going to there's going to there being widespread acceptance. Yeah, and, I, yeah, I agree, and th and that's why I think that embryo selection will be more well, comfortable me, to people, even if it's not scientifically. I mentioned as one, one fact yeah. even about embryo selection. So I'm I'm an affected person. I have a. Um, uh, a uh, recessive uh, uh, trait, that, a genetic trait, as does my wife. Uh, if we were to have conceived a child in the ordinary way, one out of every four of our children would have, could have come down with a pretty awful disease. Um, so we'd be prime candidates for yeah. in vitro fertilization, pre-implantation -ge pre genetic diagnosis. But when you change it to, uh, would we select for higher IQ uh, at the same time, as opposed to preventing a horrible disease? Mm -hmm. We both we wouldn't want to do it because we don't want to think about our kids that way. Yeah. I don't want to think uh, that I am choosing a child based on one trait, making an invidious comparison to other children we might have, children for whom the procedure might not, uh, the, the selection of the embryos may not yield the maximum possible response. Kids aren't just uh, an IQ score, and I don't want to think of them that way. Yeah. And. Uh, you could pose the question to the audience with a variety of wordings mm -hmm. that could give you very different numbers of raised hands. Yeah. And given all of yeah. these taboos, I don't see people flocking en masse, other than maybe some people like us, academics who value mm -hmm. intelligence more than the average person. And even I would draw the line. Yeah, and I think that it might... Oh. There we go. Good job. Um, my, my personal view on this is that this is just, it's another domain where we will all deploy our values. And with the diversity of values and, and different people and different cultures, different societies valuing uh, different things. The, the, but the issue is with this diversity uh, there, and with the, where the technology will be, some people will have the ability will, and the desire, and it'll be legal in their jurisdictions to make certain decisions, and others won't. Well, cloning that, is not legal right now anywhere on right. Earth. You want to have, you want to clone your dead child because you think you're going to replace right. them. There's nowhere on Earth you can do that now. Yes, but embryo embryo selection is legal in a lot of places. And then the question is, the thing that I asked the the audience is how much information will people want? And there'll be some jurisdictions where say that will say you can't have that information and some uh, jurisdictions where people will be able to have that, in, that information. And then, Jamie, could I yeah, jump in? Yeah, two seconds, because I, I want to go to these things, but just okay. one, very quick. Well, um, I, I agree with um, almost all of what Steve yeah. said, but uh, I just want to flesh something out a little bit. So editing, yes, will contain lots of risks, because we mm -hmm. won't really know the pleiotropic effects of specific yeah. edits for a long time. That's sort of for the gene engineers in the far right. future. Although the technology, I think, will be available to actually do it if we want right. to do it. We just won't know how to do it or exactly where to do it. But uh, if you look at IVF, uh, currently worldwide, there are approaching a million cycles of IVF yep. done every year worldwide. And what the way these um, embryo selection technologies, I think, are going to work their way in are as follows. The first value proposition is going to be something like this. Well, we have six embryos. We have a selection problem. OK, you're going to select them. You're going right. to select one to implant, or yep. maybe two. How are you going to do it? Well. We might as well test for the three or 4,000 known Mendelian conditions mm -hmm. that uh, any of these embryos could have. Um, people are familiar with Downs, which is sort of like a 1% right. risk in the population. But people are not familiar with the fact that the aggregation of those few thousand Mendelian diseases is another 1% or 2% risk. Yep. So you, if, you, if you went to someone and said, hey, well, everybody tests for Downs now, how would you like to reduce this 1% yeah. or 2% risk? I think everybody would say, well, I'm in the IVF clinic. I, I might as well test for this extra 1% or 2% risk yeah. now that it's possible. Yeah. Now, rather than select for, hey, this is a super brainy embryo, let's implant it, you could have the opposite thing happen where the tests are run and you just get a warning if one of your embryos is a big negative fluctuation. This kid is likely to be well below average in IQ. Would you like that information? I think everybody would like that information. Yeah. And then slowly things are going to creep. Yeah. I, I completely and, agree because people, yeah. people. I mean, we had the vote here. Yeah. People will want the information. They'll, there, as I said before, there'll be some jurisdictions where the, uh, there'll be a collective decision. People can't have it, but people will want that information. And then some people will make decisions based on it, and our norms change. Our norms will change over time. So let me go to these questions. I'm going to start with you, uh, Dalton. So this is, it's kind of three questions in, in one. So but I'll say them all and Dalton. I don't answer. know if I'm engineered enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, that's why you have, you have the NASA, the cool NASA shirt. So it gives us a lot of confidence in you. 
Uh, we can expect intelligent, intelligence engineering to cost money. If the wealthy will have better access, uh, will we speciate by socioeconomic class? That's the, the H.G. Wells question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then another, uh, you can answer in one word, will social um, inequality become hardwired? So should governments uh, guarantee it as a right or regulate it? Uh, taking the, the second question, I think uh, we have some in interesting uh, information already. So for example, back in 1994, uh, there was a very controversial book called The Bell Curve by right. Ernstine and Murray that argued that we had become this, there was this paradox or this irony of meritocracy. We had yeah. eliminated all the unfair legacy admissions, the effective mm -hmm. socioeconomic status, uh, the old boys yeah. network and so forth. And uh, therefore, all remaining inequality was due to genetics. Now that was right. ridiculous back then and still ridiculous today. In fact, we find that even though uh, like is marrying like more and more. Like, educational sort of mating has mm -hmm. been increasing, uh, even though we know that there's genetic effects on on uh, socioeconomic attainment. They don't seem to be going in the direction that Hernstein and Murray uh, mm -hmm. suggested. Actually, we're 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 decreasingly assortative mate, mm -hmm. assortatively mating on the education uh, genotype. Um, even though we're increasingly marrying people of the same right. education level. So I don't think we're there yet I th in terms of this brave new world where uh, the inequality is basically hardwired in our genes. Right. You could argue that if we got there, I mean, we're not in, we haven't gone through the phase change yet mm -hmm. where we could speed up that process of getting there. But if we, if we get there, you can make, maybe make an argument that that's actually, um, now we're in a position where you can argue for Bernie Sanders policy where um, everyone needs a guaranteed minimum income like right. the Scandinavia mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, you know we're, it's not about a, a, a fair fight anymore right. and everybody's needs to be taken care of and if, if, if Steve's writing we are mm. genetically engineered people that are so productive um, why shouldn't we just share the wealth better yeah. um, and, and let everybody benefit from the super elite that are going to be yeah. be super productive so I who knows what the future will be, yeah. but I think we're way a, a long way yeah. from it now. And another point that I, that uh, <coughs> excuse me, I talk a lot about is that that the cost of genome sequencing is is going towards zero. At a certain point, the cost of screening out genetic diseases will be, it'll be cheaper to screen out genetic diseases than to provide for a lifetime of care for the entire population of people who are born with them. And so I think at that point, governments and insurance companies and others will be stakeholders. So here's an interesting uh, question uh, that we got from our um, webcast in actually Mongolia of all places. Um, and that is, it looks like this is really working. Ulan Batar. Right? Yeah, no, 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 it's actually, it doesn't say which town. Um, but um, to what extent will competitive forces drive the adoption of these technologies? Who wants Looking to? Me? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, I guess uh, something I might add to Steve's earlier comment is that my feeling is that the values on this issue are a little bit different in Asia than mm -hmm. here because the histories are different and people's sensibilities are different. And I think uh, for people who are familiar with Asia, the developed parts of Asia right now, the competition is pretty relentless. Uh, the kids go to school for very long periods of time. They go to cram schools. It's, it's a very tough competitive environment. And I think a lot of parents, if they knew, they could dial up something like the intelligence of a kid. I mean, of course, it, the, 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 the treatment has to be safe and effective. Okay? Right. They, if it doesn't work, forget about it. But right. imagine it were really possible. Then I think the adoption would be not so negligible. It would, it would actually happen. Yeah, I mean, you were at BGI. I mean, you were in this, this uh, film. What's it called? DNA Dreams. DNA Dreams, a very interesting film. I mean, how in the Chinese context, and with all of the work that was happening at, at BGI and the, just the obs incredible levels of, of competition. So how is it different for you, talking about these issues in China and I, talking about them here? I think here there's a, there's a if, I, if, if, if you say something like uh, genes affect intelligence, mm -hmm. there are, there's a very dangerous landscape you might enter mm -hmm. because of all kinds of social issues that we have here. I think in China, I've never heard anyone ever express any discomfort with that hypothesis. Mm. So they just accept it, and then the question is, well, what can you do with it? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, for me, that's going to be this, this big challenge, is that we can, and we should, and we must, have conversations about our own morality, how, how we think these technologies uh, should be used, how we think they should be regulated, all these sorts of things. But there we are, are humans. We're a diverse species. There will be differences. 
And then how do we account for those, those differences? And I could easily imagine, actually my last novel is about this, um, where one society makes a decision to move forward on genetic seeking at least, whether it works or not, to genetically enhance their children through embryo selection or gene editing or, or something else. Another society decides, well, that's not who we are, that's not what we want to do. Then what do you do? Do you make it illegal for your citizens to procreate with people from that place? Do you do genetic tests at your at your borders? Non, I mean, it's, non GMO from a, people. From a, yeah. Well, if, if people are worried about GMO crops, how are people going to think about about uh, GMHs? Yeah, Steve. Yeah. Well, you know that uh, something like that could already have happened if there if the differences were that extreme, because we also always could have had uh, good old fashioned eugenics, uh, mm. paying people who have higher IQs to have more children. In fact, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore flirted right. with that for a while yeah. and eventually got shouted down. Eventually, at one point, there were higher family allowances mm -hmm. for college graduates mm -hmm. than for people who without college degrees, uh, but it, it, it petered out. But uh, so you just have to put a break on our imagination. This, if the cultural differences were so extreme that there were cultures that would go hell bent on having a society of higher IQ people, they could have done it decades ago, and, and they haven't. Yeah. Uh, they, in some ways they haven't, but in some ways our societies have created, as Dalton was saying, these congregating places where we select people with high IQ and bring them together and serve but them as Dalton alcohol. noted, that, some, that still hasn't resulted in stratification by yeah. genetic intelligence, yeah. although I, it, it could someday. But yeah. I don't see it as a government mandated thing. I see it as individual parents wanting to do something. So, you know, why would you pay a lot of money for your kid in Seoul to go to a cram school? Why are you doing that? So the kid does better on the tests and can mm -hmm. get into a good university and have a better right. career. So it's individually driven. And if, if there is a safe and effective way to make sure from the beginning right. that your kid is advantaged, then you know it's the free market. It's the invisible hand that will yeah. force this, not, and, not yeah. government. And I spend a lot of time in, in Korea. And the issue in Korea, yes, individual parents feel like they're making a, an individual decision but they're doing it in a social context yes. where the people are, are competing and, and people are willing to have their kids studying until two o'clock in the morning every night and that's I think that's the, the challenge that, that we're facing I mean, we must make our own moral decisions but it happens in a global context yeah yeah I, I think that the um even though there may not be a, a difference in outcome between cram school and genetic enhancement psychologically there still is a big difference and we can yeah. see it in things like sports yeah. where you might say there's no difference between training at high altitude and taking a drug that increases your red blood cell count yeah. um, and physiologically maybe not right. psychologically there's an enormous difference yeah. we call we we uh, dopers are disgraced even though one could say well why don't we just have a sport in which you can dope all you want and it'll just be a competition yeah, it's between. called weightlifting <laughs> <laughs> But it's body but, yeah. but body highly, uh, but <laughs> highly suppressed. There's no yeah. sport where it's out in the open that that's yeah. just what you do. Yeah. And that shows that there's, and we can't disregard the psychological and moral psychological taboos, barriers in predicting what's going to happen. Because things that make no difference physiologically can make an enormous difference yeah. psychologically. Uh, I, I know a couple of us have mentioned it already, but I want to put an explanation point on the issue of pleiotropy, yeah. the notion that uh, Corn has 100,000 genes. We have about 20,000. Mm. Uh, that was a huge shock when we, mm -hmm. you know, back in the Clinton days yeah. when uh, the human genome was sequenced, that we had so few. We yeah. had just had this implicit assumption that we're more complex, therefore we must yeah. have more genes. Uh, but what that means is that those 19 or 20,000 yes. genes are doing a heavy duty. Yeah. They're, they're, they're like, you know, they're driving a cab at night, right. um, uh, each one. And yeah. if you take even ones that we know are highly expressed in the brain, yeah. like a serotonin transporter, yeah. um, it's always also being expressed in the liver. It's being expressed yeah. in the, 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 uh, yeah. the lens of the eye. I mean, there's all, all sorts of places yeah. in different stages of embryonic development. Genes are turned on and off. It's like a symphony. And if you, yeah. I, I'm a little worried that if a certain society um, across the Pacific, let's say, <laughs> Singapore or somewhere, um, starts going down this road s with a singular focus on IQ or height or any, any athletic ability, whatever you want, yeah. that we don't understand, we know enough to be, to, to be dumb. 
In yeah. other words, we know enough to, to maximize on one dimension yeah. in doing this, but we don't know what the pleiotropic effects are, yeah. whether we're going to be destroying people's livers, whether they're going to be making a, a race of autistic people. Yeah. We don't know what's yeah. going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and that's the uh, challenge, is that we are, are and have always been just a hubristic species that with little information has made, uh, made big decisions. The uh, point, and then there's one last question. Oh, well, uh, you know, again, this gets back to the editing versus selection yeah. process. If it's, if it's just selection, Right. It's a kid that you and your wife could have yes. had, yes. right? So it's one of those 10 embryos. So yep. the chances of something really drastically going wrong yeah, yeah. Um, is, is not so yeah, high. It's yeah. just you know, one I of think the 10 the possible universes that you might have lived point. in, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So last, last question, because we're running out of time. This is a topic that I think we could maybe should do like an all-nighter some night because it's just so endlessly fascinating and I know that we can hang around. Yeah, and, we, and I know that everybody in the audience uh, has strong opinions and so I hope uh, that you'll discuss this with each other, uh, with us. We're, I think we're all on Twitter, welcoming your, your comments. Um, but last question, and anybody can answer it who wants it. You kind of is, and it's, it's a derivative of, of a question that's here is, um, what does happiness mean in a genetics age? <laughs> <laughs> you stumped us. <laughs> well, I, I'll make one comment, which yeah. is that I think happiness itself is heritable. So mm -hmm. I know people. <laughs> yeah. I know people who are quite sunny, and yeah. uh, they're just never depressed, and you know, and so um, maybe that's a better way to be. Yeah, yeah. We have a new paper coming out. Subjective well-being is the outcome. Yeah, and looked for the the uh, the markers that predict yeah. it. Yeah. But just to put a question mark on that, uh, you know, the, the Danes are, uh, if not the most. Uh, one of the most happy societies, mm. at least on self-reports. That's all social desirability bias because yeah. they also kill themselves at very high rates. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but they enjoy they, it. Well, they, they, they feel <laughs> so much pressure to be happy that they just you know, have to off themselves. So that's a slippery slope. Too. Yeah. yeah. Steve, last word? Well, the, um, you know, happiness is partly heritable because everything's partly heritable. But of course, happiness is not the same as that which we strive for. Most of us do lots of things that we know will make us less happy, but they increase uh, the value of life in other ways. We, mm. we have kids, we write books, we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we engage in all kinds of things knowing that they're gonna make us less happy, but yeah. they make us more fulfilled, yeah. more fulfilled in other ways that are, are a yeah. proper object of striving. Yeah, so maybe some of us will go home and join the Danes um, but I think this is just an, an endlessly uh, exciting and interesting conversation. I hope that you all will continue it in your lives. Thank you so much to all of you, and thanks for being such a great audience.